Good morning, and I want to thank the elders here for the opportunity to speak to you today. And it's kind of strange coming here as a visitor now after worshiping as a member here for so many years. And I'm sure my mom doesn't like to hear that, but I will be leaving soon to head back to the congregation that I placed membership in Florida. But it is good to be with you this Sunday. If you would please open your Bibles to Hebrews <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 4 and we'll be looking at Hebrews 4 verses 14 through 16 in just a minute. <clears throat> you have probably heard the phrase or the saying that actions speak louder than words. Or you might have heard the saying or phrase that the best leaders are also the best followers. And I think that we all understand that leadership and true leadership is earned. The position of an elder or the position of a deacon is an earned position. A leader must follow the rules in order to maintain his leadership role. So then, who is the leader of our faith? We see that the Catholics, the Catholics have the Pope, or the Muslims, they look to the prophet Muhammad. But in Hebrews 14, sorry, Hebrews 4, and verse 14, it says, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, Let us hold fast to our confession. Jesus, our Savior, has been appointed as our high priest, the high priest of the new law. He has put away the old law and enacted the new law. In order for the new law to be put into effect, Christ had to die. Sorry. Sorry. This is said in Hebrews 9 in verse 16, for where the testament is, there must also be the death of the testator. So Jesus has put the new law into effect by his death, and we are subject to his commands, making him our leader. But Jesus is not a leader that would say, do as I say and not as I do. Like We might find this from someone like the Pope doing instead of saying to his followers to do something while we see him acting completely differently. Instead, if you finish the reading with me here, verses 15 and 16, it says, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Jesus does not say, do as I say, not as I do. He leads us by his example. Jesus came to this earth and took on flesh. He became like us. He went through what we go through and then so much more. And because of this, Jesus can be our sympathetic Savior. But what else does this verse talk about? This verse brings out the idea that we have weaknesses. And so we all have individual strengths and weaknesses. Turn with me to Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 20. In Proverbs 20... In verse 29, it says, that's Proverbs 20 and verse 29, the glory of young men is their strength and the splendor of old men is their gray head. And it is no no secret that we often find that young men are stronger in ways than older men. And so therefore, a young man's strength is his physical strength. But it also says in this passage that an old, man, an old man's strength is his wisdom. His experience in life gives him wisdom. We see throughout 
instances in our life that it's not the old men that say are on a football team. It's young men that are playing football. And when we take a look at the armies of the world, the young men are the ones going out, and they are fighting in combat. But it is not uncommon for us to see someone that is older, that is in a position where he is telling <clears throat> the younger men where they must go and what they must do. And because of the wisdom that he holds, he can put them in a safe place or a strategic place. And so we all have our individual strengths, but we also all have mutual weaknesses. We all fall into temptation. In Romans 3, verse 23, it says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Sin has ensnared you, and sin has ensnared me. We are all guilty of sin, and at some point in our lives, we were separated from God. We had sinned, and sin separated us from God. And so this is one weakness that we all have. Another weakness that we all have is that we all will die. Turn with me to Psalms. <clears throat> Psalms chapter 49, Psalms chapter 49, verse 10 and 12. For he sees wise men die, likewise the fool and the senseless person perish, and leave their wealth to others. The inner thought is that their Houses will last forever, their dwelling places to all generations. They call their lands after their own names. Nevertheless, man, though in honor, does not remain. He is like the beast that perish. Man is like the beast that perishes and dies. And while millions and billions of dollars have been spent to try and to combat the effects of death, and while some may find ways to prolong their life through surgery, or others might find ways to appear younger, whether through working out or surgery as well. No one can conquer the power of death. We are simply too weak as individuals to conquer death. But Jesus was not. Jesus was different. He was able to bring others back from death. He himself did not die, but rather was raised on the third day, <clears throat> to which more than 500 people saw him at one time. And this is what, it is, and this is what can enable him to be our forever high priest and savior. And because we have all sinned, we are without the power or we are too weak to save ourselves. Turn with me to Romans 5. Romans 5, verse 6 through 11. For when we were still without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love towards us. In while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life and not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Once we sinned, we were without the power to save ourselves. We needed Jesus as our Savior and as our mediator <clears throat> and our high priest. We all have mutual weaknesses. We have all sinned. We will all die and we are without the power to save ourselves because of our sin. So then, if Jesus was able to overcome our weaknesses, how can he still sympathize with us? And that is because Jesus 
felt the same emotions as we do. Jesus was tempted the same as we are. And finally, Jesus made sacrifice. So Jesus felt the same emotions as we do. In John 11, turn with me to John 11. <clears throat> John 11, verse 32 through 36. And this is the account of the death of Lazarus. When Jesus heard that Lazarus has died, he tells, tells his disciples that they will go and visit the family. And so <clears throat> in John 11, verse 32 through 36, it reads, Then when Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Therefore, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her weeping, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him. Jesus wept at the death of Lazarus, just as you or I would at the death of someone that we truly love. And we see Jesus feels more emotions than just sorrow. He was also in agony in Luke 22. Luke 22, as he is preparing to die, preparing to die for our sins, to be betrayed. And when he is in the Garden of Gethsemane, in Luke 22, verses 41 through 44, it says, And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw. And he knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Then an angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. Then his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. We read already in Hebrews 4 and verse 16, it says that we should come boldly to the throne of God in our time of need. And this is exactly what Jesus does. Jesus uses prayer to talk to God, the same method that we have to talk to God. Jesus was in agony in this situation. Jesus was sweating like great drops of blood falling down to the ground, it says. And he asked God to take it away, but not his will be done but God's. And we know that Jesus could have taken himself down from the cross when that time came, or that he could have called 10,000 angels as we sing. But just because he gave his life of his own free will does not make the sacrifice that he made any easier. It did not remove the pain of those nails being driven into his hands. And it did not remove the pain of the scourging that he suffered before he was put upon the cross. And it did not remove the crown of thorns that was beaten into his head. And it certainly did not remove the pain of suffocating from a lack of being able to push himself back up just to take one more breath. And yet through all of this, Jesus did not sin. And even though he did not sin, it is not to say that he was not still tempted. <clears throat> in our starting passage in Hebrews 4 and verse 15, it says, Jesus was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. And we see this exact thing happen when we turn over in Matthew 4. Turn with me to Matthew 4. We'll read the first four verses where we see Jesus <clears throat> is tempted the first time. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted for 40 days and for 40 nights, afterward, he was hungry. We see that Jesus was feeling some of the same feelings that we have. He was hungry. And so the devil is about to tempt him with the flesh. Now, when the tempter came to him, he said, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, 
It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. After being extremely hungry, he fasted for 40 days and for 40 nights. Jesus did not use the power that he had to turn those stones into bread for his own gain. Continuing the reading, Jesus is tempted again in verses 5 through 7. Then the devil took him up into the holy city set him on a pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, he shall give angels charge over you and in their hands he shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. And Jesus said to him, it is written again, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. <clears throat> it's almost like the devil is saying, just, just do it, just try it. See, see what happens if you jump off. See what happens. The angels will catch you, it says it. He's, Jesus had responded with scripture the first time. And so the Satan, Satan says, well, the scripture says he'll catch you. But Jesus responds again with scripture saying, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. You shall not tempt the Lord your God. And Jesus was tempted again with the lust of the eyes in 8 through 10, where it says, and again, the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. And Jesus said, away with you, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only you shall serve. Then the devil left him and behold, angels came and ministered to him. How many politicians or rulers of this world would take that opportunity in an instant. They would jump down and worship Satan if they were offered the entire world. The power that he could have held in his hands, the entire world. But yet Jesus responded with the scripture once again. The same scripture that you and I have. Jesus was tempted as a man and he resisted the temptation as a man. Yes, he had power that we do not have, but he did not use that power in this instance. He used the scripture. He had the same tools that we have, the scripture. And so Jesus was able to resist temptation, <clears throat> but Jesus also made sacrifice. This is very clear to us. We often think about this, but I don't know how much you have thought about the sacrifice of Jesus or how often you think deeply about what Jesus truly did for us. But when we think of the sacrifice of Jesus, I know I often think of simply just his death. And while that's not a simple thing or that's not a small thing, it's often the first thing that I think of. And maybe I don't think any farther. And we did that exact thing, we thought of his death when we remembered his sacrifice, when we partake of the Lord's Supper. And while his death was the ultimate sacrifice, it is a disservice and it undermines the totality of Jesus' sacrifice if we do not take into consideration such things as the sacrifice of leaving heaven or his willingness to, became, to become lower than the angels. Our whole goal as Christians is to leave this world and to go to heaven. And yet Jesus left heaven to come to this world, the exact opposite of what we want. In Hebrews 2 and verse 9, it says, but we see Jesus who is made lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he by the grace of God might taste death for everyone. He was made lower than the angels for the purpose of dying. He stooped down and washed his disciples' feet and became a servant. And at one point, Jesus was, asked, was told, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. To which Jesus responded, foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Jesus made so many sacrifices. And ultimately, Jesus did pay the final price. Jesus laid down his life. Turn with me to John 10. <clears throat> John 10, verse 
John chapter 10. And we'll read verses 14 through 18. Where it says, I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and I am known by my own. As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father, and I lay down my life, <clears throat> and I lay down my life for the sheep, and other sheep I have which are not of this fold. Them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. Therefore, my Father loves me because I lay down my life, that I may take it again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have the power to lay it down, and I have the power to take it again. This command I have received from my Father. We are Jesus' sheep. And simply put, we are sheep because we are dumb. Sheep are not known for being the smartest of animals and I think if you thought of back in your life, you could remember a time where you've made many decisions that were not the wisest, decisions that would have led you down a dangerous path. And without one to guide us, we might still be lost. We might still be wandering alone if we did not have Jesus as our shepherd to follow. He is our great shepherd because he sacrificed his life for us. Jesus paid the ultimate price. Jesus felt what we felt. He became sympathetic to what we experience, and he sacrificed his life. And he, Jesus says, I lay down my life for the sheep. We already read in Romans chapter 5, verse 7 through 8, where it says, For scarcely for a righteous man one will die. Yet perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love towards us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We were not good people at some point in our lives. We had sinned and had become separated from God. <clears throat> hopefully now, hopefully now you are a good person. Maybe you are even a good person that it talks about in Romans 5 that someone would even dare to die for. Hopefully, you strive to become that person, someone that someone would dare to die for. But when Christ died for you, you were not. Christ demonstrated his love for us by sacrificing himself. We were not good. We were sinners, we had succumbed to temptation, and we were without the power to save ourselves from death. So this morning, I ask you, have you sacrificed yourself to the glory of God? Have you put to death the old man? And have you been born again in water and washed away your sins? Christ paid the ultimate price for us, he gave his life. As a man, he gave his life. And he returned on the third day and overcame death. But he suffered just as we do. How far are you willing to go for Christ? If he was willing to give his life, are you willing to give your life for Christ? He gave his life for you. Are you willing to give your life for him? Or when faced with pressure, would you blaspheme the name of God to save yourself? Today, if you are feeling weak in your faith, if you have given in to your weaknesses, or if you would like to sacrifice your life to Christ now, please come to the front as we stand and sing. <clears throat>